Hello friends, welcome to Talk Tuesdays, our special mini lecture series. I'm Laura Gonzalez, the Director of Education and Volunteer Services here at Santa Fe's Premier Living History Museum, El Rancho de las Colondrinas. We're located, located in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley. We are joining you here today with a live audience from our Palo Himo Education Center on site. And joining us today is longtime volunteer and award-winning culture artist, Julia Gomez, to share with us a little bit about the history and the tradition of culture embroidery. I am very pleased to welcome her now. Thank you, Julia, welcome. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for inviting me. Buenos dias. Glad you could come. I really appreciate you getting out in this wind. It's miserable. Now, don't I look different? I look a little bit younger in that film, in that slide. This, uh, this PowerPoint was made in uh, 2011 when I was invited to the International Embroiders Guild in Naples, Florida. And they paid for me to go do this presentation on culture embroidery. Today, I want to give you some history about the journey to New Spain and all the way up to New Mexico. In 1493, the Spanish left their homes for the New World. By 1519, they were living in Mexico. In 1565, the Manila Galleon trade routes took spices, textiles, and exotic goods from China to the Philippines to Mexico and on to Spain. In 1598, 400 men left Mexico and traveled north. 150 of these men brought their families from Zacatecas they traveled up the Camino Real, the Royal Road, which was a path created by the indigenous people throughout the years. The families traveled by foot, mules, horses, and oxen pulled the carretas that they, they probably had made themselves. The Spanish brought the many animals to New Spain. According to Jose Esquivel, who wrote the Oñate expedition, the caravan was five miles long and one mile wide. The Monton was one of the treasures that, that was made of silk that came from the Philippines. It went from the Philippines to Spain, where the women in Spain just adopted the Monton, and it was theirs forever. Uh, Henrietta Christmas, who gives lectures on the women on the Camino Real, she has a list of all the things that, um, that the women brought up to New Mexico, to New Spain. And one of them are, were family heirlooms like the Monton and filigree jewelry that, they, that, brought, that were brought over on the Manila Galleons. The Spanish brought 7,000 animals. 5,000 of them were the chudo sheep. In Spain, the money was in the merino sheep, and the merino sheep were not allowed to go any place. Their, their, uh, their fleece was silk and lustrous, but they allowed the explorers to bring the chudo sheep, which they considered the peasant sheep because their, their fleece is rough, it's coarse, it was used for rugs and carpets. But here in, in the New World, they became the prize sheep because first of all, they fed the colonists, they used their, their fleece, they adapted to the climate, they needed a little water, and here they became the prize sheep. And eventually, New Mexico became a sheep state. In 1880, there were four million sheep in New Mexico. 500,000 of them right here in La Bajada. Dr. Lyle McNeil from um, Arizona, from Fort Wingate, he and some other people developed the, um, they started the Navajo Chudo Sheep Association. And we're very thankful to our, our brothers and sisters, the Native Americans, because when the US government came, they decimated the, uh, the sheep herds and the, but the, uh, the indigenous people were very smart and they hid them and they hid them and that's why we still have the remnants of the Chudo sheep, which are really called Chura. 
because you're going to find as you volunteer here that uh, people that speak Spanish, they call them chura, and they're still called chura in, 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 in Spain. But I talked to uh, Mark Simmons, and I said, why are, they, why are they called chura here? And he says, you know, I don't know because there was no documentation then, but probably it was one of the, the frontiers, one of the cowboys that changed it to churro instead of chura, and it stuck. Um, these are beautiful pictures taken here right on the grounds of the churro sheep. Before you can use the fleece, you have to shear the sheep. And when I was young, in 2000, I wanted to do it all. <laughs> I was younger in 2000. I wanted to do it all. I wanted to shear the sheep. At that time, Sean would have a sheep shearing day, and all and all the ladies were invited to do the women's work, and the men would shear the sheep. We would go in and we take pictures of their names and their numbers, and uh, because they're registered with the Tudor Association. And he taught us, he taught the women how to take the fleece after it was sheared, roll it up a special way, take it outside, put it on the table, and then skirt it. And that means you clean the unusable, unusable uh, wool and get rid of it. And then we would package, uh, save some of the wool for our, our uh, exhibits and working here at the ranch. And then some of it we'd send off to Mora to make into roving so it was easier to use. So I went, I wanted to learn to do this. So at that time, I had a friend in Mora, and she had a few sheep, they were kind of pets. So she would, you know, she was elderly, and she would, she, she would shear them, you know, maybe one a week until the, she was done. And so I spent the day with her, and I sheared the sheep with the uh, blade shearers, and you know, I was trembling, the sheep was trembling, and uh, at the end of the day, I said, okay, you've done this, and you're too old and too little to keep it up, so now I just talk about it. <laughs> so next, you have to, uh, actually, you have to wash the wool. And the Native Americans also showed the Spanish how to use the root of the yucca to, for soap. And um, so I did this too. I went out and I found a yucca and I took a pick and a shovel and I tried to get that root out and I had to call in somebody to help me because it was stronger than I was. But I got the root and I took it home and I broke it open with a rock and the inside of the root is creamy and white and it's sudsy and it smells like spring. And uh, everybody at that time during the colonial period used the root of the yucca for soap. Uh, now, I, I just finished washing a ton of yarn for the uh, embroiderers that belongs here, but I buy this um, animal wash. It's called Orvis on Alameda Street at the feed barn, or I use Dawn. Dawn does wonders or baby shampoo to wash the yarn. Um, but I learned this from a fifth grader. I'm washing the wool, demonstrating, and the teachers are wonderful because they prep their kids before they come here, and so they know a lot. So I'm washing the wool, and I'm talking about the yucca plant, and he says to me, I know about the yucca root. It has saponins. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure. Saponins is a natural occurring compound that causes suds. And I said, oh, that's really good. You're a smart kid. So we have wonderful teachers in the state. Don't let anybody kid you. After uh, you wash the wool and it's dry, then you, um, you spin it. No, you cart it. And if you, uh, I was hoping that the farmers were here because um, these little girls um, are the granddaughters of the uh, farm, what's her name, the, the couple that come here and the two little girls here in the middle, and that's um, Nicole's daughter in the middle when she was young. Now she's married, she's in the service, she comes to visit, and these girls are graduating from college. But they're using the, they're carding the wool, which aligns the fibers, makes it easier for the spinner to spin. That's important. And then um, 
there you spin the colonial people spun the wool on the malakati, which is a wooden spindle. It takes a long time. The um, I'm using, I'm at the bottom here, and I'm using the spinning wheel, which probably didn't come till the 1800s. Though the, uh, I think the spinning wheel was developed, was invented in India in 500 AD. Okay. Um, then after you have the, the clean uh, yarn now, then you can weave. You can uh, go to the weeding room. This is the weeding, the uh, old loom that is a replica of an original one that was here. At that time, their volunteer, Norm Jordan and Hal Jackson, built, they replicated the old loom. The old loom is in the archives at the Folk Art, I believe. But this is a beautiful loom. The wood is all hand assed just like it would have been when uh, the colonists were here. The one on the right is a modern loom at the Espanola Fiber Art Center. When I first started in 2000, I, I, I spun all this wool, I made the warp, but you know, I wasn't good at that time. And I had a lot of breakage, so you can see the mess that I have on that weaving loom. But that was my first year and I wove six yards of savania. After the weaving, we're getting to the culture. After the weaving, then you dye the wool. In the spring and the fall and the summer, the ladies would collect flowers and roots and plants so that they had um, some pretty colors to, uh, to use in their culture embroidery. This is here at the um, our dye shed that isn't open very often, but um, I hope that we can do some more dyeing because when Beatrice was here, she was the um, the the um, director of the spinners and weavers, and we all took a turn. We all learned to spin really well. We all took a turn at the dye shed. So I hope that um, this year we can continue to do that. Now you finally get the yarn, all colors, and you want to embroider. This is the colcha stitch. In English, it's the couching stitch. And the women that came, they already knew how to embroider. They already knew fancy knots. They had fine textiles and fine threads. But here, they didn't, all they had were the sheep. And so they chose this stitch because imagine sitting out here in the, late evening, just before it gets dark, having a time for yourself and sitting down to embroider. So they use the couching stitch, which is long laid stitch, tack down. Then you do another one right next to it. Lay it down, tack it. Culture stitch is a filler. It fills spaces. It's not an outliner. Um, I, I, I did this pattern. I use a pattern. I'll cut out cards or a magazine or draw something and then transfer it onto a piece of textile. And then I try to embroider things the way the plant grows. Like you see the leaf. If you looked at a real leaf, you would see the veins in it and you would see the shape. And so that's what you try to do with the thread. Sometimes in colonial times, like now we have green. We always have to have the right color of green. Uh, but in those days, you know, whatever yarn that was left over, they would just use it. And so I, you kind of do, do some lines, so the directional lines, so you can stay within those lines when you're embroidering. There are two types of colcha. Um, this is Kathleen Lerner, who was in Spanish Market, and she won the grand prize with that piece there, and it's completely covered. She was a school teacher at that time, and she would she bought this is these are all um, commercial yarns and commercial textiles. She got some muslin cut out pieces, and she would you know go to school and teach. And when she had duty and watching the kids for recess, she was embroidery, and she won the grand prize. And then that was it. She quit uh, Spanish Market because her 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 husband said. We need, we need our mother to make us dinner. And uh, he said, we just ate hamburgers. I would go and get her a hamburger and make her eat because she wanted to finish this. 
for the uh, for Spanish market, and she did, and she won the prize. And I really miss her because she was a, she was an outstanding artist. That to me, I look younger, don't I? And uh, I have the luxury of of uh, weaving my own savanilla, which the colonial women didn't. Um, and so I, that's part of my art, my weaving. It's not terrific, it's not the best weaving, but then I embellish it with my design. Um, these are some early colches. In the 1750 and the 1800, they're done in the colonial way, where the, the women didn't have savanilla. They didn't have any textile. They would just like find a little cloth, piece of cloth, and then they would sew it together to make one big piece. And then they would embroider it on the face and cover all of that ugly cloth. Once the Santa Fe Trail opened in 1821, they traded. They were so happy to see textile. They would trade for linen and cotton, muslin, and then they would embroider, like you see these pictures here, and you don't have to cover the textile. Um, there were a lot of women that didn't even know about the sheep or spinning or weaving. They just bought their textiles, but they saved the stitch. One of the ladies, um, Rebecca Salisbury, um, came with the Taos artists, and she was married to Paul Strand, who was a photographer. And uh, you know, she was already famous for her. She did reverse glass painting. She was already famous for that. But across the street, she lived across the street from Jesusita Peralt, who did a coach embroidery. So she taught Rebecca how to do the coach embroidery, and she became very uh, famous for her coach embroidery. I got to see this piece like in 2000, or maybe in 99. Uh, it's as big as a, a table mat, and it sold for $11,000. Um, Lucretia Sanchez Villalpando, uh, this was just kind of like all coincidence. I worked at the highway department when I first graduated from high school, and I met Stella Wheeler, who was a sister to this lady. And um, she's the one that gave me the picture. And she was a part of Los Artes Antiguas, which was a group of ladies out of Española who continued the art of culture. But one of their requirements to be in that club was that you had to do a full-blown bedspread with a center medallion. And uh, I got to see this piece before it was sold. This is the one that Lucretia did. Maria Hesch uh, grew up here. She was an author. She loved to write children's book and tell stories of what it was like growing up, like making tortillas or uh, making pozole. And she was very a very famous artist. She was also she also did embroider, and that was one of her pieces. And her estate left money to pay for the award for Spanish market. There's always a little prize, like a hundred dollars or something, to um, uh, if you win the blue ribbon. And so her estate pays for that prize every year. Angelina Delgado, um, her, uh, I met Angelina. She was a very famous tinsmith. And I met her at the uh, senior center where I used to take my mom to eat. She was, she was living in one of those homes and she would come to eat. And so I said, well, I would, and Helena, I, would, I do culture, and I would love for you to make me a tin frame. And she says, okay, bring me your embroidery. So I took her my piece of embroidery, and she says, oh, no, I don't like that thick stuff. And I said, oh, and she says, we, used to, we have very delicate fabric. We would take the thread and separate it and separate it. It was very delicate, and our embroidery was very delicate. 
And I said, that's beautiful, and that's the way it should be. But I do the colonial style. It's called estilo morisco, the style of the Moors. And my embroidery, and that's why I'm here. I want to continue the story. It's from the colonial period. It was that short period that they had nothing except the sheep. And so I do it from the sheep up. Once the Santa Fe Trail opened, well, of course, the embroidery goes back to being really fine and delicate, like you see it on many things. But I am here to continue the story of the colonial women. It was named Colcha Embroidery by a lady that didn't speak Spanish, because if you hear the word col uh, Colcha, it means blanket. It doesn't mean, it doesn't have anything to do with embroidery. No, no Spanish-speaking person would have named this embroidery culture. But uh, E. Boyd, who started the collection at the museum in the 1930s, she knew that the women embroidered on blankets because if there was like a, a hole, a mock hole in the blanket, they would embroider a little picture of a bird or a flower. And so E. Boyd knew that. So when she started writing and documenting these pieces, she called them uh, Colcha Embroidery. The real name is Savania Labrada. Labrada means worked, labored. And uh, so if you're going to look in the archives, if you see the word Colcha, it's a blanket. It's not embroidered. It'll, it'll, it, sometimes you'll see that it was bordado because the Spanish word for embroidery is to bordar. And you'll see, once in a while, you'll see um, savania bordado or savanias. But anyway, we're stuck now with culture embroidery. This is Monica Cecilia Halford. She was my teacher to learn the stitch. In the 70s, Monica was teaching at the folk art, and so I took a day off from teaching. I was at Harvey Junior High, the first junior high here in Santa Fe. And um, I went and I took a class and, you know, and then I taught school and, and had a family. And uh, later on in 1998, my friend uh, said, Monica's teaching a culture class. And I said, well, I've already done it, but I'll go with you. And so Monica at that time encouraged me to be in Spanish market. I didn't get in the first time because I was using commercial yarn and commercial fabric because Beatriz Sandoval Maestas won Best of Show in 2000 with, because she resurrected Savania. It hadn't been seen at Spanish market for a long, long, long time. So she set the bar. And I met her and I said, well, I didn't get into market. And she said, well, you come with me. And she brought me here. And I spent the whole summer working every day. That's why I have this because I would come and, and she taught me how to spin. We talked about the sheep. We died. We spent the whole summer. And from then on, I fell in love with the story of the sheep and this place. And so uh, I am very grateful to uh, Beatrice and to this ranch because I've gotten to travel around the world with my embroidery and I get to talk about it this is the future. They're already grown up. These are Beatrice's granddaughters. And uh, one of them's, um, I think they're already out of college by now. But aren't they beautiful? And I, I love to teach the children. I love to card with the kids here. One year, the Museum of Spanish Colonial Art gave me a grant to teach at the Senior Center. So these are the ladies that I taught. That's my mother in the red hat and the ruby red cheeks. Uh, she didn't take the class. She taught me to embroider as a child, but you know she's like me. If there's a camera, she's in front of it. And then the gentleman there, he didn't take the class either, but his wife did, so that's why he's in the picture. But we had a grand time at the senior center. I have a group at the Museum of Spanish Colonial Art. They meet on the second Wednesday of every month from 10 to 12. Uh, we're not called Las Colcheras Coloniales because after we called ourselves th this, the people from 
the Las Cruces, the farm and ranch, they said, we already have that name. So now we call it Las Bordadoras, because that means the embroiderers. And this friend here at the bottom that is laughing, she's, she's laughing because that piece of embroidery she has sewn to her dress. Do you see it? <laughs> and that happens too. <laughs> okay, uh, you don't have to watch a video uh, again, but I, I put that there because I want you to know that um, there's a lovely video by my daughter. It's called The Art of Culture Embroidery by Sarah Maria Gomez. And you'll see it on YouTube. There's another one called The Culture Circle. Annette uh, Gutierrez Turk also has a video uh, on YouTube. She volunteers here. Monica Sasaya has a video. And of course, Beatrice also has a video. Um, we're going to finish by showing you some of my work. This is an early piece. It is at the Hispanic Cultural Center. It was designed by Dolores Martinez, who um, worked here for many years in the office. Uh, these are some of my early pieces. That's just a frame there from Jackalope that I found. It had a mirror. I took the mirror out, and I put in colcha. And this is my favorite piece because this, is the, this was my piece. 2010, I won the grand prize at Spanish Market. The name of this piece is Las no, El Jardín de las Golondrinas, the Garden of the Golondrina, of the Swallows. Um, you see the golondrinas, our favorite bird, and these are all the flowers that we see here at the ranch. Uh, you know, Julianne is the, is the gardener, and she always, the flowers will bloom. You just, it's a beautiful summer here. And this piece is at the uh, museum in Albuquerque. They purchased it for their collection. Um, that's me looking younger. And uh, that the piece behind me is El, La Tilma de Juan Diego. And remember, uh, the our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to him. So I, t I wove the, the savanilla and then sewed it together so it, you can put it over your head. And um, on the back of it, there's, it's filled with roses. I did not win a prize. And then I was really discouraged. And I said, well, now what will I do with it? And I said, well, maybe the, la the priest at the Guadalupe Church will wear it on the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. But in that morning, in walks this beautiful, tall, young woman, golden hair, and her husband. They're dripping in turquoise. And she looks at it, and she says, honey, I want to try this on. Is it OK? She says to me. And I said, sure. She puts it on, and of course, she looks gorgeous. And he says, honey, if you want that, I'll pay for it. And uh, he says, how much do you want? And I said. Twelve hundred, and she he says okay. Pulls out his his wallet, pays me, and away goes my tilma. And she looked beautiful, and um, she comes every once in a while. She's a great collector. She has my very best pieces. I'll tell you. She li she lives in Texas, so uh, I hope she comes this year. But anyway, that's me, and that's the story of Colcha. Do you have any questions? Did I skip something? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Am I in the camera with you, Miss Julia? <laughs> a little bit more this way. You scooch over a little bit more. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Oh. Thank you to our live audience for joining us and for our audience out there in cyberspace. Um, once again, this has been the one and only master culture artist, award-winning, world-renowned, a dear friend of mine, a longtime Las Colondrinas volunteer, Julia Gomez. Another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. We hope that you all come to see her out at Las Colondrinas. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary here at Las Colondrinas all season long. We'll open officially in June. We've got lots of things going on. Julia will be here on 
uh, at least once a week on yes. different festivals. She'll be here with her mm -hmm. culture. You can sit down with her, chat with her, learn a little bit about the art of culture, and probably try your hand at it as well. Definitely make sure to visit her at Spanish Market, um, the Santa Fe Plaza, and check out her beautiful pieces. Maybe you'll take one home. Um, that's every about mid-July. It's the, the last weekend in July. Last weekend of July, mm -hmm. Santa Fe Plaza. Um, and for all things Golondrinas, make sure to uh, look us up on our Facebook, on our Instagram, both at SF Golondrinas. Um, we've got a couple more Talk Tuesdays coming up later in the month, so make sure to check on those sites for details about that. We'll be having some more mini lecture series talking about more things about the history of New Mexico. And we hope to see you out this season. Remember, your adventure starts at golondrinas.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye, friends. Bye.